ان الحمد لله نحمده ونستعينه ونستغفره ونعوذ بالله من شرور انفسنا ومن سيئات اعمالنا من يهده الله فلا مضل له ومن يضلل فلا هادي له واشهد ان لا اله الا الله وحده لا شريك له واشهد ان محمدا عبده ورسوله وبعد we begin by praising allah we praise him we seek his help and we ask for his forgiveness and we take refuge with allah from the evil of ourselves and from the evil consequence of our evil actions. Whomsoever Allah guides, no one can misguide, and whomsoever Allah leaves to go astray, no one can guide. And I testify that Allah alone is worthy of worship, and that Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam is the servant of Allah and his final messenger. Today we are going to be talking about another major sin. In fact, something that is more than just a major sin, it is a matter of Iman and Kufr. Every nation, every society has laws through which and by which it must live in order to have a peaceful and successful and prosperous society. This is the case without exception. Wherever we look in human history, whether it is in the present or the past, human beings need laws, they need structure in order to govern their affairs. Perhaps in an ideal scenario, a theoretically ideal scenario, every human would be left free to do whatever they want. And certainly human freedom is a desirable quality. However, the reality is that human beings often, in their pursuit of their own desires, in their own self-interest, inflict harm on others. So. That is why we have laws, that is why we have rules, because those laws and rules restrict the freedom of the individual in order to protect the society. And throughout history, of course, different nations have been struggling with this balance. Where is the point where the freedom of the human individual should be limited by laws in order to protect the society? Now, some societies use as the basis of their decisions concerning this issue the human mind. And it would be very difficult for them to come to any type of conclusion if we were to say, well, we don't accept the human mind. We don't accept it as a means for you to arbitrate in these issues. But that is the criterion that they choose to use. As Muslims, we don't believe that that is the right criterion. For us, there is something above the human mind. There is something superior to the human mind. There is the revelation of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. There is the knowledge and the wisdom of the creator of the heavens and the earth. And as Muslims, we have been ordered to judge by that which Allah, the creator, the wise, the exalted, the mighty has revealed. And that is our standard. As Muslims, we judge by what Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has revealed. So we find that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala in the Quran, He told us in Surah An-Nisa, which is the fourth surah, in the 65th ayah, فَلَا وَرَبِّكَ But no, by your Lord, they can have no faith. Allah took an oath by Himself that you cannot have iman, you cannot have faith until they make Muhammad, you Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, a judge in all disputes between them. And furthermore, they find no resistance in their hearts against your decision, but submit to it with the fullest submission. So Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, He made it very clear that those people who are people of faith, when they want a judgment in any matter, they go to that source, they go to that base, and that source and that base is the revelation. That is the guidance that has been given to the Prophet ﷺ. And unless they do that, they can't have any faith. And Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, He made it clear that we as Muslims need to resort to all our disputes. Anything that we have a dispute about, we need to bring it back and refer it to 
the wisdom and the guidance of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And not only that, if we are truly people of Iman, we will find no resistance against our hearts and we would submit with the fullest submission. Because how is it possible? And this is the meaning of also what Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala he tells us in the Quran. How is it possible? It is not possible for anyone who believes in Allah on the last day that once Allah and His Messenger have decided upon any matter that they should have any choice but they will submit to that and abide by that. Also we find Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala mentions also in Surah An-Nisa O you who believe, obey Allah and obey the Messenger and those who have been given authority amongst you. And if you differ in anything among yourselves, refer it to Allah and His Messenger. That is best for you for final decision. So if you believe in Allah on the last day, that is the reality. That you will submit yourself and you will surrender to the guidance of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And many different places in the Quran, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, He referred to and He directed us to this reality. And He called those people who refer to judgment to other than Allah's guidance, He compared them to those people and He equated them with those people as being the people of Jahiliya. The people of Jahiliya are the people before Islam. The people from the time of ignorance, when there was no revelation, when there was no guidance from Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And this is the meaning of what Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala said. When Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala mentioned in the Quran also in Surah An-Nisa, which is the fourth surah in the 56th ayah, have you turned your vision to those who declare that they believe in the revelations that have come to you and those before you, yet their real wish is to resort together for judgment for their disputes to the evil one, even though they were ordered to reject him. But Satan's wish is to lead them far astray from the right path. So here in this verse, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, He is reminding us about those people that although they claim to believe in Allah, they don't actually want to and they don't actually desire to be judged according to what Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has revealed. So in reality, what is there except Allah's guidance? What is there except Allah's judgment? There is only the misguidance of Shaitan. And this is what they want to refer to. They want to refer to the evil one. They want to refer to Shaitan. But that is not possible. How could a people of Iman, how could a people of faith wish or desire to resort to judgment to anyone or anything except Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala? We also find that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, He mentioned and asked, do they seek for a judgment from the days of Jahiliya? Do they seek a judgment from the days of ignorance, but who for a people whose faith is assured can give better judgment than Allah. That's also in Surah Al-Ma'idah, which is the fifth surah in the 50th ayah. So who is better in judgment than Allah? Whose judgment is better than the judgment of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala? But there are people who want to resort to the time of ignorance. And what was the judgment of the time of ignorance? The judgment of the time of ignorance was the opinions of men, imposing their ideas one upon the other. The judgment of Islam is the judgment of the wisdom of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, of His guidance and of His sharia. Therefore, no wonder Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala in the Quran, He equated those people who do not judge by what Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has revealed as being similar to the unbelievers. If any do fail to judge by the light of what Allah has revealed, they are no better than unbelievers. And if they do fail to judge by the light of what Allah has revealed, they are no better than wrongdoers. And if they do fail to judge by the light of what Allah has revealed, they are no better than those who rebel. Now, many people today, they question the Sharia 
they questioned these laws and they accused the Islamic Sharia of many different types of things and many different deficiencies and shortcomings and actually it will be worth looking primarily before we make such a judgment at those people and their laws and to see how effective they are because in fact in reality when we look at the societies and many of the western societies who are so vocal in condemning the Sharia of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala they are so vocal in condemning the laws of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala what do we find? that they themselves are in a state of confusion and chaos concerning their legal system there is very little disagreement that the penal system in the western world today has really failed miserably to deliver the security and the justice that a penal system should demand for example what is the point of having laws why do we have laws why do we have punishment at all the purpose of laws and the purpose of punishment surely must be amongst its primary objectives to protect people in society from criminals and wrongdoings that goes back to what we started about there are some people who in expressing their own personal freedom actually infringe upon the rights of others now the purpose of the law is to prevent that and to reprimand and to punish those people in a way and in a manner that will make sure that that offense is not repeated if the punishment does not fit the crime then the reality is the criminal will not stop and they will not desist from committing those crimes so what we find is that western societies particularly have failed miserably to actually reform and correct criminals in fact what happens in western societies is that people go into prison and when they go to prison they meet other prisoners and they spend time with other prisoners and those other prisoners actually educate them in crime they teach them how to be better criminals so in a sense you are sending people to a university of crime and people leave prison more hardened more expert in committing crimes and so what has been served by a so-called justice system like that number one the criminal has not been reformed number two the innocent people in society have not been protected from the crime of the criminal now that is a total failure since neither of the main objectives of having law and having crime prevention and having punishment have been achieved so it's very strange for people and for societies who have themselves really failed miserably to accomplish any reasonable state of success in preventing and stopping crime to complain about Islamic law the most important thing in reality is that the law that is implemented is successful as a deterrent in preventing people from committing further crimes and of course that it is implemented justly and fairly but the issue of justice and the implementation of laws in a just manner is not the main point of this discussion and we'll talk about that at another time but right now the main important topic is the actual laws themselves now of course as Muslims we believe that those laws are from Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala as we have already stated that we have already said and because they are from Allah and from his wisdom absolutely it is our obligation in our countries and our lands uh, to implement those laws where that applies and on a personal level where we have the ability to there are certain laws of course that can only be implemented by the ruler and by those particular people who are qualified within the context of a society and there are other things that of course we as Muslims we have to apply in our own daily lives and that becomes our own responsibility so no one should confuse the two things no individual Muslim has for example the right to implement the legal criminal punishments on their own no that is something that can only be done by the state 
So basically, we look at the Islamic system of punishments, and there are basically three categories. The first category of punishments is what we call the hudud. The hudud are punishments that have been prescribed by Allah, by the Creator, and they are revealed as a part of the Qur'an, or they have been mentioned on the tongue of the Messenger Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, and we find that they are matters about which the early Muslims have agreed. So we find that they are things that the companions of the Prophet Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam and the early scholars agreed about it. And that is something, my brothers and sisters, I would like you very much to think about. Because there are some people today making really ridiculous and absurd claims that there is no such thing as Islamic Sharia, that is the religion of Islam doesn't really teach us about governance and about criminal law and so on and so forth. And first of all, this is completely refuted by the verses that we have quoted already. And there are other verses in the Quran uh, that make this absolutely clear. But it's also very clear from the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam and what he said, and by his companions who unanimously implemented these laws, and that that is something that has been done throughout the entirety of human history. And although there have been times when occasionally some laws have been neglected and the implementation of certain laws have been neglected, or it has been done in an unjust or in an unfair manner, and that has happened occasionally throughout Islamic history. Like we find today, for example, very few countries are actually applying the Sharia in the correct way, if at all. They just have aspects of the Sharia. And of course, all of this is a deviation and a cause for the punishment of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and His anger to descend upon us in many, many different ways. And of course, part of the punishment is that if we abandon those laws that Allah has revealed to us out of His wisdom, then we will suffer as a consequence in our society because Allah knows us best. Allah knows what is best for us as human beings. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala knows His knowledge is perfect. What is the best way to punish crimes? Not only that, what are the most serious crimes that are deserving of punishment? This itself is a matter of discourse and disputation amongst those people who are not Muslim. But for the Muslim, of course, it is very clear. And it is clear because we refer to the revelation of the Qur'an, we refer to Allah and the prime basis from which we take our guidance in this regard is the Creator Allah and the knowledge that He has revealed in the Qur'an and the Sunnah as was understood by the early generations of Muslims. So there are the certain punishments, the prescribed punishments that are called the Hudud uh, and there are basically six offenses that are considered to be under the Hudud and one of them is drinking alcohol. There is a prescribed punishment for that and we'll be talking about that later. Uh, the other is theft, the other is armed robbery, the other is illicit sex, both adultery and fornication and homosexuality and bestiality, all of them have prescribed punishments. Also slander of a pious, chaste woman, or we could say sexual slander, has a prescribed punishment and apostasy. So all of those things have prescribed punishments that we could call them, in a sense, they are not all the death penalty, but there are different punishments for those different crimes. Now, the quality of these hudud punishments is that, number one, it is the right of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala that they should be implemented and no one should be moved uh, to pity or anything like that. No, this is the right of Allah. These have been ordered and they must be implemented. If uh, someone presents one of these crimes to the court in the manner that is prescribed and in many cases actually the conditions are very strict in order for anyone to be actually found guilty for example in the case of adultery we'll talk about that later uh, there needs to be four reliable witnesses who actually see the act taking place not something that is very easy to come by but if it is brought to court and the conditions are met then there is no way out from that punishment being implemented. And it cannot be made lighter, and it cannot be made heavier. It has to be implemented exactly the way it is. Also, it cannot be pardoned by the judge, 
and it must be public. The punishment must be seen to be done in public. So those are some of the conditions that need to be implemented for these hudud, punishments that are prescribed in the Sharia, about which there is no doubt and about which no believer has any confusion that this is part of the religion of Islam. And then we have something called qisas. Qisas means retaliation, and that is a punishment in Islamic law for murder and injury. So there is an eye for an eye, tooth for a tooth, an injury for a injury, and that of equal severity that is inflicted. But there is an allowance for any of these things for the person who is injured to forego the punishment to the one who injured him and also to take a monetary compensation and that includes the case of homicide as well uh, of death for example or even killing uh, then this is something that there is the uh, what is called the qisas the retaliation but there is also the means and the available way to pay compensation for that and then there is another type of punishment which is called ta'zir which is a discretionary punishment that the authorities have the ability to implement for certain crimes. So there are certain things that the authorities uh, can apply. It could be imprisonment, it could be beatings, or various other types of punishments may be allowed for various types of crimes that is at the discretion of the authorities. Now what do we find, my dear brothers and sisters, throughout uh, history? There have been times when we have seen that the Islamic Sharia has been applied and we have seen the effective and the good and the beneficial results of that in society. For example, recently in Saudi Arabia before the 1930s, there was no Islamic Sharia implemented in Saudi Arabia. Yet, however, when the Saudi, the present Saudi regime, the king who uh, was the descendant of the present uh, rulers implemented the Islamic Sharia, crime almost virtually disappeared from that part of the world. It transformed from a society where people did not feel safe to travel from one place to the other, where the exact opposite condition was existing. And in fact, in reality, that actually very, very few uh, punishments were actually implemented. So we find, brothers and sisters, throughout history, in the history of Islam, that this law of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has been implemented and when it has been implemented and when it has been practiced we find that a very peaceful, a very prosperous society exists. And many of us have heard stories and accounts and perhaps we've even personally witnessed it ourselves uh, that for example in Mecca, in Medina, in Saudi Arabia there are stories of people who have shops where they sell gold of just covering their gold with a cloth, going to pray and coming back and finding everything still in its place. Brothers and sisters, this is part of the beauty of this beautiful religion of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, that if only we followed it and practiced it, we would find happiness not only in our personal life, but our collective lives. So until next time, brothers and sisters, assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh.